Wooper's back, and he's tanner than ever. Let me just check a couple things real quick. Yep, still cute, and yep, still trash. Perfect. Today, we're gonna find out if this little guy has what it takes to rise to the top of Paldea by trying to beat Pokemon Violet using just one Super Wooper. The game begins, and we head downstairs to check out, uh, check on our mom. I'm the director of the Uva Academy. Yeah, yeah, we know. Where's Wooper? What? The director takes us outside and shows us our choice of starter Pokemon, but we're not interested in any of these nerds. So we pick the worst one and zoom through the rest of the early game, overcoming our rival Nimona, falling down a cliff to save this big boy, and finally, after defeating our second rival Arvin, we learn he doesn't really have parents, which explains his haircut. Now we arrive at our destination. Oh, the sacred pool, where heroes are born and our legend begins. We seek out the greatest specimen among the swamp, catch our new hero, and give him a name to live up to. Before we move on, I do want to know who are your favorite new Pokemon in Scarlet and Violet? Like the video for Wooper, subscribe for Wooper, and comment and let me know why it's Wooper. Now we have our first true battle of the game against Nimona. Things look grim against her Quaxley, but right as we're on the verge of defeat, we discover this is no ordinary Wooper. This Wooper has superpowers. The first being its ability to turn enemy water attacks into healing with its ability Water Absorb, which saves us against the duck and allows us to defeat it. Then we duke it out with Nimonia's second... <coughs> Then we duke it out with Nimona's second Pokemon, Palmy. Don't jump! It comes in and makes a whole show out of putting on a fancy hat. <laughs> nice try. Wooper's second superpower is its immunity to electric type moves thanks to its ground typing, which definitely makes this big hat seem even more ridiculous than it already is. We still love you, Palmy. After our unlikely victory, I couldn't help but wonder what other secrets could our friend be hiding? I mean, it seems silly, but could Wooper be a legendary in disguise? You laugh now, but we'll see who's laughing once the DLC comes out. Our next stop is the Uva Academy, where we learn about the three main storylines of the game. Victory Road, which is your normal eight gym badges into the Elite Four. The Path of Legends, which has us teaming up with Arvin to track down the five Titan Pokemon in the region. And Operation Starfall, where we team up with the mysterious hacker Cassiopeia to take down the region's evil team, Team Star. After a quick time lapse and learning to ride our new Pokemon, motorcycle, we're set free to roam the world. From here on out, we're able to tackle the storylines of the game in any order we see fit. There might be spoilers coming up for some of you, so you may just want to skip ahead a few seconds if you care. Instead of going to take on the bug-type gym leader in Cortondo, we head east of the city and seek out the first Titan. This is because this first Titan is a rock-type Pokemon, which our ground-type Wooper should have an advantage on. Should be easy enough. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> Thankfully, this big boy has plenty of children around for us to practice on. After training our Wooper to kill any crab on sight, we're able to use a couple mud shots to send this thing running for its life. Bye! We chase it to the bottom of the cliff, where it breaks open a cavern and eats something that sends it into turbo mode. Luckily, this isn't too much of an issue as Arvin arrives on the scene, and we double-team this oversized crustacean. With the Titan defeated, we're able to head into its lair and recover a stock of the magical herb of Mystica that it was guarding, which Arvin uses to make a sandwich so good that after Maridon eats it, it remembers that its legs are literally jet engines. Using our new sprinting capability, we can finally live out our lifelong dream of doing donuts in a Pokemon game. We drift our way east to the tiny town of Artisan. For fresh produce, look no further than Delicioso. After a healthy, balanced meal of eggs, chorizo, and potato salad, is chorizo a vegetable? We head to the local gym. Normally, this is the second gym that you would take on in the game, but we decide to break the sequence yet again for reasons that I'll explain in just just a second. First, we need to wrangle some naughty Sunflora. How is it possible that the Pokemon we're currently battling is not fully loaded in? Did anyone playtest this game? After searching the town, we return with a massive following and lock these flowers up for good. Now it's time to battle the gym. Is this guy gonna show or? <laughs> Hey, get down here. The gym leader Brassius superhero lands on the battlefield, but we both know that there's only one real superhero in this fight. The reason that we decided to do this gym before the lower level bug gym is because of Wooper's third superpower, its ability to terrestrialize. When activated, terrestrialization replaces our Pokemon's secondary ground type with its Terra type, which changes our Wooper from a poison ground dual type into a pure poison type, meaning that we go from taking neutral damage from our opponent's grass type attacks to resisting them. This resistance allows us to 
to easily poison tail our way through his first two Pokemon. Then he sends in his ace Pseudo Wudo, which he proceeds to terrestrialize as well, transforming it from a pure rock type into a rock grass dual type. His made up name for it might need some work, but that lame name doesn't stop it from beating our Wooper into the ground. Not to worry though, after training up a few levels and getting a lucky miss on a rock throw from our opponent, we're able to win the fight and secure our first badge. Now we double back and head west of Mesagoza to the town of Cortando to face off against the next gym. Look at this team play from everybody on Team K. So flip reset immediately back onto the ball. Oh, oh, and he puts it through the defense tie game. With our new sponsor, we head into our first battle as Moist Quinn, where we face off against the bug type gym leader, Katie. This is our first battle where we don't have a type advantage against our opponent, but this is a bug type gym leader, so how hard could it really be? Oh no, 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 no. Despite multiple high rolls from our opponent, we clutch it out on one HP, receive our second gym badge, then meet a member of the Elite Four named Hassel, who looks and walks exactly like an anthropomorphic paintbrush. Next, we make our way over to the Asado Desert, where we take a break from the storyline to battle a few trainers. Ah, the joys of youth. You just can't wait for me to die, can you? After defeating five of these chumps, we talk to the league official at the Pokemon Center outside of Cascarafa, who gives us a TM for Earthquake as a reward for our victories. This is just about the strongest move that Wooper can learn, so it's a pretty big deal. After getting that TM, we make our way over to this mountain, where we frog our way through some boulders as we climb up to face the second Titan. The first phase of this fight takes us a few tries, but eventually we're able to use a yawn on turn one, then protect on the following turn to put this big bird to sleep. We take advantage of this nap by chipping it down with a few poison jabs, beating the first phase of this fight before it wakes up. The Titan then eats some steroids and goes into a rampage. Again, Arvin finds us just in time to help out with the second phase where we, uh... Rip. Thankfully, Arvin's able to take it from here and finish Big Bird off while we politely watch from the sidelines. You defeated the Titan Bombardier. Yup. I sure did. After the fight, we head into the Titan's cave for a nice herb witch. Then things get a little personal. I'll, I'll show you mine if you, you show me yours. Okay. Hey, don't laugh. Look at the way it just lays there. Can't even stand up. With another great beast slain, we venture over to the first of the five team star hideouts. This is where we meet Clive. Now, there's a few things you need to know about Clive. Clive is cool. Clive wears sunglasses inside. Clive drives a sports car over the speed limit. And Clive is definitely not the director in disguise. After a short conversation, Clive enlists himself into Operation Starfall. With Clive on our side, anything is possible, except taking on a Team Star base with one Pokemon. For some reason, that's not possible. To get into the base, we're told we need a team of at least three Pokemon, so we double back to the Sacred Pool, where we add Twooper and Throoper to our elite kill squad. Yes, that's right, this is where we technically fail our challenge. And for what, Game Freak? For this? After we complete whatever this is, we're able to return our team to normal and challenge the leader Giacomo. Before we battle Big G, we make our preparations, teaching Wooper the fighting type move Low Sweep, which is four times effective against Giacomo's lead Pawniard and two times effective against his ace Reverber. But this car proves to be too high octane for us to handle for the time being. In any other Pokemon game, we would be stuck on this fight forever trying to force our way through. But thanks to the open world of Scarlet and Violet, we're able to skip this fight for the time being being and instead travel to Lavincia, where we can take on the next gym leader, Iona. Before we're able to do that though, first we have a battle against Nimona, who seems to be on a mission to construct a team that is as hard countered by Wooper as possible. We take out a Rockruff and Palmy with a couple earthquakes, then she sends in... Stupid! The fact that she learned about Wooper's water absorbing ability in our last battle does not stop her from terrestrializing our Quaxwell and firing off a water pulse. Realizing her critical error, she tries to salvage the fight with a workup, but it's too late. We're able to finish off the duck with a couple more earthquakes. After defeating Nimona, we meet the internet sensation, Iono. Director, what are you doing here? Not so fast, big guy. Now that was content. So what do you think? 
After pumping up Iona's stream numbers, it's time for our battle. We take out her lead watch rail, then we learn that her belly bolt only has two attacks, spark and water gun, both of which can't damage Wooper, which means we can take it easy and set up a couple layers of toxic spikes to poison her next Pokemon. We take out her belly bolt with a couple earthquakes and experience from taking out this belly bolt is enough to level Super up to level 32, where it learns the move Amnesia, which sharply boosts your special defense. We go for one of these against her Luxio before taking it out. This boosted special defense allows us to barely survive against her Miss Magus as we chip it down with some poison jabs, landing a lucky poison to finish out the fight. After the gym, we decide to head north and investigate the second Titan. Oh, 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 oh. You sure this is the guy? The beast makes a break for it, but eventually we manage to get it cornered and force it into a battle. Oh, nice. It's a steel type. Earthquake is going to be great. Huh. We chase it down again and put it to sleep with Yawn on turn one, then use low kick on it, thinking that something this big made entirely out of steel is probably pretty heavy. It seems that our hypothesis was correct because these kicks do massive damage, allowing us to easily shred through this Titan and secure the Herba Mystica. After an awkward lunch where Arvin refuses to make eye contact with us, we move on, passing back through Mesagoza on our way to the fourth gym. While we're in town, we meet a psychic who tells us about a past life. Not only is she a psychic, but she's also an expert craftsman as she whips us up the single greatest fashion item in the game right there on the spot. I'll never forget the times we shared, ball guy. We move out of Mesagoza and into the oasis of Cascarafa. Before we take on the gym leader, we check out the local Delibird Express, where we find some absolutely insane held items like the leftovers. Hey, here, hold these. Now we head up to the gym and vault in Veluza. Uh, who is that guy? Ah, the gym leader. Right. In a rush, the forgetful gym leader Kofu ran off to an auction without his wallet. Obviously, his employee can't be bothered to take it to him, so we're forced to do it. We trek across the desert until we arrive at the auction. Without my wallet, I won't be able to get today's hot item. Hey, I have your, uh... Shut your mouth. Jeez. This rude dude refuses to let us help without some tude, so we have to teach him a lesson. We deliver the wallet, win the auction, then head back to take on Kofu. I figured that since this was a water-type gym, it would be a real gimme since, you know... Whooper's immune to water type attacks and all. Huh. Yes, you saw that right. That is, in fact, us getting destroyed by a water type attack. It turns out that Kofu's lead, Veluza, has the ability Mold Breaker, which allows it to bypass our water absorb. We give this fight a few more shots before deciding it's probably not worth the trouble quite yet. After abandoning that challenge for the time being, we decide to go ahead and clean up some loose ends with Team Star. We head back to Giacomo's hideout where we donate this clunker to Cars for Kids. Donate your car. Then we make the short trip out to meet up with Team Star's next leader, Mela. We destroy the guard out front, then meet up with Clive. And oh, who's your little friend here? Charlos? Charlos? I know there are a lot of problems with this game, but the person at Game Freak who nicknamed him deserves a raise. Charlos leads the charge as we bring Twooper and Throoper out of retirement and slaughter our way through the base. Then we challenge the leader Mela and her fire types. We're able to use our offensive type advantage to get through her lead Torkoal, but Super doesn't resist fire type attacks, so we end up losing to her offensive powerhouse Revivroom. We give this fight a few tries until we have an idea. We dust off the old TM case and bust out a classic jam, Rain Dance, which Wooper is able to use to overwrite the sun that her Torkoal sets up. In Rain, Mela's fire type attacks are decreased in damage by 50%. This damage reduction allows us to live long enough to break her car down with some earthquakes. After the battle, we reunite Mela with her old bestie, Charlos, and say our goodbyes as we head out to train up our Wooper before heading back to try our luck against Kofu. Aww. It's his happy dance. Against his lead Veluza, we barely survive an Aqua Cutter turn one and get off a yawn. After protecting on the next turn, it falls asleep as we hit it with an earthquake, which takes out about half of its health. The next turn, we pray that it stays asleep and our prayers are answered, allowing us to finish it off with a second earthquake. Next, Kofu brings in his Wug Trio, who heals us up with a water pulse before getting one shot. Finally, his last Pokemon, Crabominable, comes in and terastalizes. Here I was thinking that there's no way Crabominable could look any sillier than it normally does does, boy was I wrong. Anyway, it's not packing too much of a punch, so it beats the same fate as its friends. With those three quick victories, we're starting to get a little bit of momentum. We continue this momentum over to Madali, which is the home of the next gym leader. We employ the old math class classic, Trial and Error, to solve the riddle of the secret menu item, which allows us to challenge the gym leader. Right out of the gate, Homie makes it clear that he has a day job and is on the clock. We thought he was telling us this because it was gonna be some, you know, casual workday fun, but it actually turns out to be the hardest 
longest fight we've had so far. In our first few attempts, there were a few times where we managed to get through his lead Pokemon Kamala, only to be instantly decimated by his new Dunsparce and its super effective ground type moves. After getting tossed around by the gym leader for a bit too long, we decided to take a break for our own lunch. Am I crazy for thinking it's weird that 99% of the buildings in this game don't have interiors, but they made one for a freaking subway? With a full belly, we train up Wooper, then return to the gym. A big problem that we've been having with this battle is that his lead Kamala always hits us with a yawn on turn one, which means we always fall asleep against his most dangerous Pokemon, Dudunsparce. To get around this, we try giving our Wooper a Quick Claw, which if activated would allow us to go first and drop this bear before it's able to make us drowsy. This time around, the Quick Claw doesn't activate, but we continue the fight to see where it goes. We use our newest move, Body Press, to take out the Koala, then his Dudunsparce comes in. We fire off a yawn, fully expecting to take massive damage from this thing, then fall asleep at the end of the turn like we have so many times before. But that doesn't happen. Instead, this worm fires back at us with a glare, leaving Wooper paralyzed. Normally, this would suck because, you know, being paralyzed sucks. But since we're paralyzed, we aren't able to fall asleep. The next turn, our luck continues as this thing misses its drill run, and at the end of the turn, it falls asleep, allowing us to finish it off with a second body press. This is the first time we've made it anywhere close to this far in this battle, so we're a bit nervous as his Staraptor comes in and terastalizes. But we continue to get lucky fighting through our paralysis to defeat this angry bird with a couple more body presses. As we're exiting the gym, we're ambushed by Nimona and the champion of the region. Nimona then proceeds to 360 dunk on us in our weakened state. Woo, congrats, good job. We bounce back from this defeat, then travel deep into the Tangle Tree Thicket, where we battle the absurdly low frame rate that this game runs at as we seek out the team star leader, Don Atticus. Eventually, we lag our way to his base, beat the living crap out of some random kid out front, then pull in our back up to slaughter the faceless masses inside the base until Don Atticus rears his ugly mask. All of his Pokemon are poison types, so let's just say this doesn't go well for him. As we're making our way out of the forest, we come across a curious little encampment of Team Star grunts. This is a home for Team Star dropouts? Man, you gotta be some special kind of lazy to be a dropout from the dropouts. We get away from this camp of wild cards as fast as possible, then traverse up the snowy slopes of Glaciato Mountain until we arrive at the town of Montanavera, where we take on the next gym challenge. This gym is entirely in the doubles format. Suit up, Twooper! It's your time to shine. Trooper! No! After a few attempts, we're able to scrape our way through the three battles of this gym challenge, then head out to face the gym leader, Ryan. We give this fight the old college try, but for now, the damage of two Pokemon at a time proves to be just a bit too much for Super to handle. We take a break from the horror of Rhyme's spooky squad, instead heading to the desert to seek out the next Titan, which we find zooming its way across the landscape. Despite its generally badass appearance, this elephant isn't able to put up too much of a fight as we put it to sleep, then earthquake it down. Here's our little herb, man. After training up our Wooper to its max power level and giving it a soft sand to boost the power of its ground type attacks, we're able to head back to Montanavera and one-shot our way through our battle with Prime. Even though we just defeated the ghost type gym, our choices for what to do next are still looking a bit grim. In terms of level order, the next part of the story would be the psychic gym. But given the fact that Wooper is very much weak to the psychic type, that doesn't seem too promising. What's the next thing? Oh! <laughs> Ice type gym. Okay, uh, we're weak to that too. Interesting. We decide to break the order yet again and try our hand at the ice gym. First, we need to hit the slopes. He is taking speed now. Crawford's line out of here was really good. Over the final jump. This is gonna be very big close. Play. It's a big jump, 140 to 85. I think it's gonna be in oh! here by 1600th of a second. After shredding the course, we're able to take on the gym leader, Grusha. You may be thinking that ice types are a bad matchup for us given our ground typing and all, but much like the grass type gym earlier, terastalization saves us yet again. We start off with a big miss from Frostmoth on its blizzard, allowing us to put it to sleep with Yawn. While it's asleep, we take the opportunity to boost our special defense with amnesia and terastalize, then take the bug down with a rock slide. Next, he sends in his Beartic, who hits us with a super effective Earthquake, but we manage to put it to sleep, then take it out with a couple rock slides before it wakes up. We stall for a bit against the Satitan to heal up with leftovers before taking it out with a rock slide as well. Finally, he brings in his Ace Altaria. Thanks to our boosted special defense from Amnesia, its Hurricane doesn't do too much damage, and we send this bird off to bed. Huh. That was surprisingly easy. Now that we've secured our seventh gym badge, we slide our way down the mountain to check out what this whole psychic gym is about. Here we face off against our most daunting foe yet, our feelings. Calm 
down. I'm calm! We barely managed to break through our toxic masculinity, but we don't get anywhere close to being able to beat the gym leader Tulip, so we put this gym on pause for the time being, instead opting to seek out the next Titan. Oh, found him! We team up with Arvin to beat this big fish down. Mm. I didn't know you had elves working here. With the tiny titan out of the way, we find our herb and blaze it up with Arvin. After we finish our lunch, we get a call from Professor Turo, Arvin's dad. The whole time we're on the phone, I'm just wondering if Professor Sada from Scarlet is also this version of Arvin's mom. And if that's the case, is Turo the Arvin from Scarlet's dad? And if that's true, do different Pokemon versions take place in parallel universes? Maybe I should lay off the Herba Mystica for a while. Anyway, Turo tells us he's in danger and that he needs us to go to his lab and get some stuff to help him. While that sounds fun and all, it's gonna have to wait. Still not feeling quite up to the task of beating Tulip, we instead go to take on the team star leader Ortega. This time around, we decide to take a more covert approach to infiltrating the base. Unfortunately, we're stopped in our tracks by a voice on a loudspeaker. We may be trying to dismantle the entire organization of team star and destroy everything that they stand for, but we don't wanna be rude now, do we? We politely knock on the front door, then destroy Ortega's fairy types with our super effective poison jabs. At this point, we're sort of caught between a rock and a hard place with only two story events left to do. We still don't feel quite strong enough to be able to beat Tulip just yet, so we try our hand against the last team star leader, Aerie. Despite us having a defensive advantage against Ares fighting types, we aren't able to beat her. It's been a while since we've tried out the battle against Tulip, we give it another go. We put her Ferregerif, Furry Jerif, Furry Jerry. We put this thing to sleep with Yawn, then proceed to max out our special defense with three amnesias. It does eventually wake up and hit us with a Zen headbutt, but we're able to take it out without taking too much damage. The rest of Tulip's team consists entirely of special attackers, so our maxed out special defense allows us to easily roll through the rest of the fight with some Terra boosted poison. Poison jabs. Completing the final gym gives us access to the champion test up at the Elite Four building above Mesa Goza, but like any good superhero, Wooper decides that it's more pressing to deal with the rogue criminal organization that's currently operating out in broad daylight. So we head back to Ares' lair to put a stop to this Team Star nonsense once and for all. The first four members of Ares' team don't give us too much trouble, the biggest thing keeping us from beating her is her final Pokemon, Revivroom. It has the ability Stamina, which means that every time we hit it, its defense is boosted by one stage. While our attacks are just tickling this big boy, it just sits there and boosts its attack with shift gear. Every time we think we have Aerie on the ropes, we just don't quite have the damage to deal with this tanky beast before it smacks us with a boosted super effective high horsepower. Eventually, we're able to connect the dots, realizing that we need to bring a special attack to use after Revivroom's defense gets too high. So we add Sludge Wave to Wooper's moveset. This simple change is more than enough to send this jalopy off to the junkyard. After the battle, we learn that Cassiopeia, the mysteriously leader of Operation Starfall has actually been the big boss of Team Star the whole time. Eh, don't care. I'm gonna go become champion. We make all the necessary preparations for battle before we climb the hill to the west of Mesagoza and head into the Elite Four. Wait, what? A test? Nobody told me there would be a test. Oh no, I forgot to wear pants today too. Of course we aced the test. Don't you know who you're dealing with here? With our perfect score, we head into the battle part of the assessment against our first opponent, Rika, who just so happens to specialize in one of our two biggest weaknesses, ground types. <sighs> This fight, let me tell ya. We give it a few shots just to scout out her team a bit. This shows us that outside of Doug Trio, her Pokemon are pretty slow. So if we're somehow able to boost Wooper's speed, that would be a huge advantage. It turns out, Wooper's able to learn the grass type move Trailblaze, which in addition to boosting her speed after we use it, also hits Rika's entire team super effectively. The second major adjustment we make is replacing our usual held item with an air balloon. When held, this item makes us immune to ground type attacks until we take damage. Her lead Whiskash goes for a high Hydro Pump on turn one in an attempt to pop our balloon, but of course this does nothing other than allow us to get speed control with the four times effective Trailblaze, leaving her Whiskash super low. The next turn we clean it up with another Trailblaze, further boosting our speed. This speed boost allows us to outspeed her next Pokemon, Donphan, hitting it with a chilling water which lowers its attack. This softens the blow from its Iron Head, that damage does finally pop our balloon, but at this point that's not too big of a deal because most of our setup is complete. We finish off her Elephant with an Earthquake, then against her Dugtrio we get super 
super lucky is it goes for a sandstorm instead of attacking, which allows us to finish it off without taking any damage. Then Camerupt comes in and does the only thing I've ever seen Camerupt do, dies to a super effective attack. Finally, we face off against her disgusting, mutated Wooper. At this point, we're faster than it, so all we need to do is live through one single Terra Boosted Earthquake, which we thankfully managed to do, then finish it with an Earthquake of our own on the following turn. Next into the Octagon waddles the Bambina of the crew, Poppy. Unfortunately for her, our tiny friend here specializes in steel types. I certainly wouldn't call this an easy fight, more a simple fight. It pretty much just boils down to us putting her Pokemon to sleep with Yawn and hoping they don't wake up as we beat them down with low kicks. Eventually, we get the luck we need to kick the legs out from under her team and move on to our next battle against the Wage Slave Larry, who has recently reinvented himself as a flying type trainer. Good for you, Larry. Glad to see her bouncing back after the divorce. While we don't have a type advantage in this fight, it surprisingly turns out to be the easiest one so far. We terrestrialize instantly against his Tropius, then put this banana boy to sleep and set up max special defense with amnesia. After getting all situated, we're able to use the old yawn protect play to put his team to sleep and safely poison jab our way to victory. With Larry out of the way, the final member of the squad, Hassel, creaks his old bones onto the battlefield where we duke it out with his dragon types. Much like his granddaughter Poppy, this is another battle that's reasonably hard but mostly straightforward. We set up amnesia against his lead Noivern, then take it out. Next, this Draggle G comes in and gives us a nice little heal with Hydro Pump. Then we terrestrialize and proceed to put his whole team to sleep and pray they don't wake up too early as we pummel them with poison jabs. Eventually, we get the sleep luck we need to outlast his back Scalibur and take the fight home. <laughs> I'm, I'm just so proud of you. Bro, you don't even know me. Chill out. With the salt from Hassel's tears all over our favorite jacket, we make our way up to the top of the building and face off against the champion slash fashion icon, Gita. Before we go into the fight, let me just show you her team real quick. Notice anything? If you look closely, you may see that every single one of her team members has a move that hits Wooper super effectively. While this isn't a great sign, it's not gonna stop us from trying. Maybe we'll come back to this one. We put this fight on pause as we head back to Mesagoza to deal with Cassiopeia. Before we do that though, we head up to Monte de Vera where we trade a bottle cap to a guy who I guess really likes bottle caps. In exchange, he hyperbolic time chambers our whooper into a perfect golden god. You know, you could just buy these at the store, right? What? Uh, never mind. After making Super more perfect than it already was, we take our mini god over to the schoolyard to face off with Cassiopeia. But as we're making our way there, we're stopped by Clive? <laughs> What's up, man? You want to you want to hang or something? <laughs> True identity? What do you what do you say? <laughs> You were the director the whole time? This game is really giving me some trust issues. Anyway, the director wants to battle and you already know I'm happy to oblige. We give it a few goes against Clavel with limited success until we eventually come up with a strategy. Our first problem is his lead Orin Guru who pretty much always uses Yawn to put us to sleep on turn one. This is super annoying, but as we eventually find out, there's a small chance that this monkey uses foul play instead. So we reset the fight until that happens, then put it to sleep with the Yawn of our own, Terrasta and poison jab it down. Next into the ring is his Gyarados who smacks us with an earthquake. We fire back with a yawn to put this big boy night night, then start beating it down. We do get a bit unlucky with it waking up after one turn of sleep and hitting us with a second earthquake. Not great, but thankfully not the end of the world as it goes down on the same turn. Next up is the director's Obama Snow, which is less threatening than the other Pokemon we've seen so far. So we take this opportunity to put it to sleep with yawn, then max out our special defense with amnesia. With max special defense, Wooper becomes basically unkillable for the director's last three Pokemon, so we finish them off with ease. After the battle, the school admin Time comes out to investigate the illegal battle that's currently taking place on school grounds. Of course, she's pissed and takes the director away for some discipline that he seems just a little bit too excited for. Ugh. With a bad taste in our mouth, we head to the schoolyard where we learn that, surprise, our hacker friend Penny has been the king of the nerds the whole time. Unfortunately for her, though, her team of evolutions doesn't put up too much of a fight against Super and 
and we easily defeat her. Now that we've wrapped up Operation Starfall, we decide to put the finishing touches on the Path of Legends. We meet up with Arvin outside of his dad's lab, pretend to care about his childhood, then head inside and get directions from the professor. He tells us to bring the Violet Book to him in Area Zero deep inside of the Great Crater. Before we head to the crater, Arvin decides he needs a little battling warm-up and challenges us outside of the lighthouse. We beat him first try, so not too much to report about the battle itself, but during the fight, we did see Scovillain's tongues for the first time. Definitely wish that wasn't a thing. Before we're able to head into the crater and save the day, first we need to finish what we started with the Elite Four. So we reluctantly head back up to take on the champion like a lamb to the slaughter and proceed to do our best Doctor Strange impression. Unfortunately for us, our strategy for this fight ends up being pretty time consuming. A big problem we're having is with her leadus Pathra and its signature move, Lumina Crash. This is a psychic attack that not only does big damage, but also harshly lowers our special defense when it connects. If our special defense is lowered even one time, we have zero chance against her Ace Glamora with its beefy special attack. So what we end up having to do is stall out all the PP for Lumina Crash by yawning, protecting, and setting up Amnesia. After Lumina Crash is off the table, we're able to use the leftovers to basically heal all the way back up and finish maxing out our special defense. All that just to beat her first Pokemon. Like I said, time consuming. After finishing off as Pathra, the rest of the fight pretty much just depends on us getting lucky with how long the champion's Pokemon stay asleep as we beat them down with Earthquake. Eventually, we find ourselves with a promising attempt. Kita brings in her Glamora. All we need is to survive one Earth power, which with our maxed out special defense shouldn't be an issue. Oh, a critical hit. Poor thing. After taking some time away from Pokemon, we come back, repeat the same strategy, and don't get crit this time to take the fight home. After the battle, the champion bestows our new title and escorts us out of the building. Of course, Demona is right there to congratulate us, and she's also itching for a final showdown. We drag our weary bones into the center of Mesagoza to face off with our rival for the final time, and proceed to mop the floor with her on our very first try. Close enough. With all three storylines complete, we team up with our three friends, then head into our final challenge in Area Zero. We dive into the crater and start deactivating all the locks in the various research stations to get inside and save the professor. Yeah, last time I was here, uh, I caught a flying taxi out of the crater. They always come through. Excuse me? Did you just say flying taxi? Why did we just jump out of that building then? And why are we still walking? Unfortunately, Arvin has no answers, so we continue to work our way through the crater, battling the strange creatures that call it home. Deadly bot. Eventually, the professor explains that Area Zero is actually a time machine at the bottom of the crater, and these Pokemon we've been fighting are all from the future. A future where it seems that every Pokemon eventually turns into a robot for some reason. Anyway, we walk our ass all the way to the professor's lair, then after dispatching an angry mob of Pokemon out front, we head head in and meet up with them. This is the ultimate battle of the game against Turo's cyberpunk squad. He has some serious hitters in here, so things start off a bit dicey. Luckily, his team is a little worse than the champions at dealing with our hero, which means we can basically fight this guy straight up. We use our tried and true yawn and protect strategy to stall for healing from leftovers as we go through, taking out his first two Pokemon with four times effective earthquakes. Next up is Delibot, who is more interested in setting up snow than attacking, so we take it out. His Iron Jugulus can't do too much, so it joins its friends. Then his futuristic Hariyama comes in and does some decent damage, but eventually goes down. Now, after living through a single attack from his Iron Valiant, we're able to finish out the fight with a poison jab. After the battle, Maridon decides to try to steal the glory of our victory for himself, but we all know who the real hero was here. Like the video and subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed it. Till next time.